chairs to be spread out. Uh, some people may come later with plenty of chairs to get rid of. I hope everybody checked themselves in and picked up a handout. A special welcome to everyone, both in person and virtual. Having just celebrated our 100th anniversary, we invite you to pick up a copy or a request by mail, a copy of the Town of Leesburg celebrates Thomas Balch Library's 100 years. Copies of the current Balch column, which is out of press, listing programs, classes, tours, and exhibits are available on the table in the back of the room, uh, along with other informative literature about the library. Events are posted to our website and on social media. All of our newsletters are available on our website. Um, so if you don't want paper, you can also go to our website. <laughs> and um, the library is owned and operated by the town of Leesburg. And during this last year, we have established our own catalog. For those of you who have used our catalog, it used to be part of the Loudoun County Public Library uh, catalog. It is no longer in there. We have our own catalog. You may access it from our website. It's called the Centennial Catalog. And we're very proud and happy about this because for the first time, all of our collection materials, regardless of the media, are accessible through the one catalog. Before we had to have lots of indexes, things weren't getting cataloged. So I, I hope if you haven't already looked at it, take an opportunity to look at it. Maps, manuscript materials, periodicals, almost anything. We're not, everything isn't fed in yet. We're still feeding stuff in, but everything that was in Loudoun County's library uh, catalog is now in ours. So um, we are very pleased about that. The water fountain is out the door to the left. Restrooms are straight back. If you have any kind of electronic device, please turn it off or mute at this time. Please remember there's a virtual audience. The event is being recorded and will be published on the library's YouTube. The link will be made available to those who have registered for the class and provided an email address. Those of you who are attending virtually may ask questions by posting in the chat box. It is my pleasure to welcome Shannon Coombs Bennett as our speaker today, an award-winning author and genealogical researcher based in Northern Virginia. She lectures and writes on various topics from genealogical methodology to genetic genealogy. Her educational background includes a BS in biology, a professional learning certificate in genealogical studies from the National Institute for Genealogic Studies, and a master's of science in genealogical Heraldic and Paleographic Studies from the University of Strathclyde, where Shannon is now a doctoral student in the History and Genealogical Studies. One quick thing I did forget, did anybody park in the town garage? Um, I'll give you a ticket for, for so it doesn't, I shouldn't, but just in case. Um, is it the temperature okay for everybody? I'm good. Okay. Please welcome Shannon. Thank you. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, DNA technology and genealogy is still a huge topic after 23 years um, after its induction to the genealogy community way back in the year 2000. More and more companies are testing and it is becoming definitely a way of life for family history researchers who are trying to solve brick wall problems, learn more about their family history, or just see where they came from in the world. So today's presentation is going to cover how in the 21st century we can combine traditional paper research with DNA and scientific research. So I'm gonna talk about, just to make sure we're all on the same page, what tests are available, what they can and cannot tell you, because that's a very big thing. You don't want to take a test if it's not going to give you the information you're looking for. Um, who can test? Because not all tests can be taken by everybody. We're going to then talk about how to combine all that information together using traditional research methodology. And the big thing I want to make sure everybody comes away with is genetic testing is another tool in a genealogist's toolbox. It's just like a census record or a deed or a vital record. It's going to tell you some information. Let me give you everybody a plant 
Gen- and testing is an enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> just like, you're like, we like to wrap up people in the time to have I mean, 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 I I've been here before. Why does this look familiar? Um, And these are the basic questions when you're doing research planning. Ask a question. Okay, try to create a question in your mind, write it down on a piece of paper, whatever you need to do that can have only one possible answer. Then start gathering all the information you do know. This is a great time. If you create timelines, this is a perfect opportunity because you'll be able to see the holes in your research based on uh, genealogical timelines, person's life. Create a hypothesis. So where do you think you should look for information? What kind of material should you be investing in? Do you need to learn more about what type of records were available at that time and that place? Because laws change and they change frequently. And one of the most frustrating things is when you are trying to find a record that never existed. Which, yes, I've done that too. (laughs) Um, And then create a strategy. How are you going to go about doing this research? Do you need to travel somewhere? If you can't travel, do you need to hire somebody to go there for you? Or ask a friend or a neighbor or a family member from that area. Can you do it online? It's wonderful that more and more resources are online, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. There are so many resources out there that are not online and you actually physically have to go to a repository. But the most important thing is you can go back and reevaluate and change this research process at any time. But keeping it written down or online or in a computer or in a notebook, whatever works for you, will help you in the long run. And it will help you with when you start adding in DNA testing information. So when you're going to go back, (laughs) when you're thinking about DNA for your research, what's important is you want to look, if you're trying to find a specific ancestor or a specific lineage, it's important to look at how far back a common ancestor would be. Are we talking about you're trying to find information on a second great-grandparent, third great-grandparent, great, you know, great grandparents, because that's going to tell you what cousin or relationship level in your match list you're looking for. When you start receiving matches from the DNA company, it's from most closely related to furthest away. So if you're looking for cousins that would share a second great grandparent with you, that's your third cousin or further back. Okay, you just add one to the great grandparents. That's your that's your quick little tip there. So third great grandparents, you're looking for fourth cousins, people that that would be the level of relationship you're looking for. Then if you can't take the test, let's say it's on a lineage line that is a direct male line. If you're a woman, you can't test, unfortunately, for a direct male line because you do not have a Y chromosome. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit more. So you might need to find a living male on that line to test for you. If you're looking for something on the direct female line, well, if you're in that direct if you're on that lineage's direct female line, anybody in this room can take a test because a mother passes on that information to all of her children. Men don't pass it on, just the women. Are we good so far? 
Okay? So it's important to understand who you may need to ask if it's not yourself and then what test you're going to take. So examples of DNA questions you may want to answer. A misidentified parentage. So you may have heard this called a non-parental event, a misattributed parental event. This is essentially where you have, you have come to realize that the person you have in your tree may not be genetically related to you for whatever reason. Not always an affair, not always somebody stepped out on somebody. Sometimes, uh, one instance in my family, there nobody knew until I did some digging in the county archives that there was a previous marriage. The husband had two wives, but all the children were merged into one and treated as one for multiple generations. Well, the first three children are only half-siblings. And that's my side of the family. So no wonder I wasn't getting the hits to my other cousin matches, okay? It could be that, you know, there's an unidentified adoption in the family. People sometimes just consumed children, related or not, into their families, especially the further back in time you go. And then obviously in the early 20th century, adoption what records were closed down in many states and really sealed tight. So many people did not know until they were adults, if ever, that they were actually adopted. So don't just jump to conclusions because somebody's not adding up. There might be another logical reason that makes you have to go to the archives or do a little bit more hunting. Um, you can also do verification of an ancestor when there's no paper trail, records are lost, records are burned, nobody's quite too sure how a relationship is developing there. And that is entirely, you know, all these people coming together, they have a, a close relationship in their DNA. But where does it come from? Well, you might be able to piece it together with, even without a paper trail. It does also allow you to, when there's, especially when there's no paper trail, verify that two people are actually related to each other. And then I think one of the biggest reasons people in the United States test is because they are simply curious about their family history. Maybe they have a story about where they're from or who they are or they're related to a specific person and they want to take a DNA test to see if it's true or not. So there are three types of DNA tests out there that you could take and add into your paper research. The most common and they are available at the five major testing companies in the United States. Yes, and there are five now in the United States. And that is the autosomal test. And we're going to talk about all these more in depth. The autosomal test is the 50% DNA you received from your father and the 50% of your DNA that you received from your mother. Okay? The Y chromosome is the oldest DNA test for genealogy. It was the first one that was out on the market backed by Family Tree DNA in the year 2000 and kind of started this whole craze. Um, but it can only be taken by male members of the family. It traces the direct paternal line and the Y chromosome is passed down from father to son. Then the third test you can take is mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA is passed from a mother to all of her children. So women pass it on, but men do not. But they carry their mother's maternal line, which means they, anybody in this room, can take a mitochondrial DNA test. But now I hope you can see why sometimes, depending on what line you're trying to trace, why you may need to find a willing subject to volunteer their spit to you, you know, either in a tube or via a, a, a cotton cloth that you wipe in your mouth. Because you may not be able to test your DNA for all lines of your family history. So let's talk about autosomal DNA first, because like I said, it is the test that is offered by every single company on the market. Now, we lose half of our genetic material every generation. It's just not passed on. Um, that means since we're having it every generation and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you can really only go back confidently. Some people, if they're really lucky, can go a little bit further, but we estimate five to seven generations. 
For most people, that's about 200 years, depending on the size of your generation. Some people have very small generations in their family. Some people have very long ones. Um, but five to seven generations with you being generation one, okay? That's why it's a good rule of thumb if you're dealing with families, especially if there are um, not many people in a generation, to test as many people as possible of the same level. For example, I am an only grandchild. So my, my grandparents had three children. My mother's two brothers had none. I'm the only grandchild. So I made sure to test my mother and her two brothers, okay? My grandparents were both deceased by the time I obviously was getting around to DNA testing. My grandfather died in 1974 and my grandmother died in 1993, way before genetic testing. But by testing my mother and her two brothers, I have a good sampling of what those two genetic lines might be. Yes, there's overlap between the siblings, but siblings on average only share 50% genetic material. So just because you test doesn't mean you're like, oh, I shouldn't test my siblings or my first cousin. They're, it's going to tell me the exact same information. It actually is not. There's going to be differences. Now, on the other side of my family, I'm the youngest of six grandkids. So that was pretty easy since I don't have... Um, since both my grandparents are, are deceased, my grandfather died in 1978, and my grandmother died in 1997. So I was able to test four of my first cousins agreed to test, so I have a nice pool. But the other, the other good thing about that is with autosomal DNA testing, it's also recommended that you test the oldest living members of your family at first. Why? Because it gets you one more generation back on that five to seven generations. So I tested both of my parents while they were still alive. Um, I was able to test one of my grandmother's sisters before she died at the age of 96. So that on that line got me another generation back. Um, and like I said, by looking at that information, it gets me back further in time. Okay, her matches will be closer to the ancestor than I am. All right. So how does this happen? Well, it's essentially what's called is recombination. When we're creating our cells to pass on, all of the DNA from your father and all of the DNA from your mother line up. And the way I describe it to my children is they like each other very much and they give each other great big hugs. <laughs> <laughs> I was explaining this to a sixth grader, you know? <laughs> and then when the DNA pulls apart, the chromosomes come apart, they have actually transferred information from one chromosome to the other. And that's why, unless you're an identical twin, nobody on this planet is going to have 100% identical DNA to you because the combinations can be different each time and in each cell, depending on how the, they came in contact and pulled away. You can also think of it like shuffling a deck of cards. If you separate the red cards and the black cards out and you have a line of red and black cards, each time you shuffle and then split the deck in half, the combinations will once again be different. And you can think of those as different siblings, the different information that will be passed on to the children. Does this make sense so far to everybody in the room? Okay. So a match at these companies mean you and somebody in the database have what's called an IBD segment, or you are identical by descent, okay? So in the example here on the screen, these are two first cousins, and they share the squared orange piece of DNA. And if we go to their parents, you can trace the orange back to this grandfather here at the top. So through descent and through recombination, these cousins inherited that piece of their grandfather's DNA. So that's what it says when you're a match. It means you have a piece of DNA in common, you and this other person, and, but unfortunately the computer can't tell you why, 
That's up to you as the family history researcher to try to figure out what the genealogical route could be. Which of the grandparents or great grandparents are so far on back could have, you could both have inherited that segment from. Okay? So let's look at a real life example. So as a scientist, my mother was a doctor. I grew up being experimented on. Yes. Yes, Shannon's more than happy to have the interns. My mother was an orthopedic surgeon. There were many Saturdays where I came in and the interns got to pretend that I had two broken legs and two broken arms and, you know, practice casting on me because that is what my mother told me to do and I would lay there. Um, so I kept the family tradition alive and I, both my boys, both my children <laughs> have been DNA tested. Um, gives me great data points to work with. But this is an example of a chromosome browser and this is one of my children. The orange lines would be the 50% DNA that he inherited from his father and the blue lines are the 50% DNA that he inherited from me. And yes, my husband, I made him test at all five companies as well because that's what I do. Um, and we know that this is a male chromosome browser because men have only one X chromosome. Women have two and because there's only a blue line on the X chromosome, you know this is a male um, data and uh, male chromosome browser. Make sense? The Y chromosome doesn't show up. It is a, it is a different test. So let's go one generation back in time. So this is what the same person, but compared to their grandparents. So these are my parents. So we have my son is the, is the dark square on the bottom through my husband and I. The blue lines are my father and the orange lines are my mother. But what it also shows you is the recombination pattern because I, he inherited this whole chromosome from me but I obviously passed it down as a combination of my parents. So you can see where they hugged each other and drew away. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. So how about we go one more generation back in time? Okay. Remember I was able to test my grandmother's sister before she died. So this is what my son compared to his grandfather and his grandfather's aunt, so his second great aunt, okay? What's nice about this is anybody who shares DNA information with my son and my aunt, who are the little bitty orange lines, I automatically know I can cut out a quarter of my family tree because if they are matching my Aunt Helen and nobody else, that means the common set of ancestors are her parents because those orange bits went from her parents to my grandmother, to my father, to me, to my son. So those are the identical by descent segments that we are looking at for matching purposes in the genealogy database for genetics. Still got everybody? I see a couple questioning faces. We good? Okay. We can always come back to it. <laughs> um, but here's the important part, the important takeaway. You have two family trees. You have your genealogical pedigree, which is all the paper research you have collected. But Due to recombination and how the bits of DNA are inherited, you also have a genetic pedigree. And by the time you get to your fourth cousins, about a quarter of the people who should be your fourth cousins in your genealogy pedigree are no longer genetically related to you. They might be in teeny tiny little bits, but we don't look at those. We don't. It's we want to keep the costs down. So for cost effectiveness, you only look at the large segments in DNA testing, 
That's how we can keep it now at under $100 for an autosomal test. My first autosomal test was almost $500. That tells you, you know, in the last 10 years or so how much the prices have dropped. Um, but because of that, you're going to start losing people. It doesn't mean you're not related to them. It just means you did not inherit the same genetic segments. And you'll find if you test siblings or even first cousins, some of them will start showing up in your siblings or first cousins test. You don't have the inherited genetic bit, but somebody else in your family does. Okay? All right. So the other thing that you can you get information on with the autosomal test is the X chromosome. Now, not all companies will give you data for your X chromosome, but I like to receive it, especially if I'm looking at a male test person. I don't want to say test subjects. It makes you sound like guinea pigs. But <laughs> a male volunteer, how about that? Because since a man only receives one X chromosome, if he gets an X chromosome match, he automatically can discount half of his family tree because that information did not come from his father. It could have only come from his mother's genealogy. So as a starting point, especially if you have absolutely no idea how somebody is related to, to another person, when that comes in, it gives you a nice starting point. Um, and inheritance is like or at least similar to autosomal DNA. For women, when they, they go through recombination, men, the Y chromosome and the X chromosome, because they are not the same size, do not recombine. So men pass on their X chromosome to their daughters intact without recombination, and women recombine and then pass on new versions to all of their children. But what's nice is, it's almost, especially if you have some male lineages in there, it's like skipping a generation. So if we look at the full female line right here, it loses 50% every generation. So 150% of the DNA, 25% related, 12.5% related. We're now to parent, grandparent, great grandparent. Second grandparent is 625 Third grandparent is 3.125% DNA, and then fourth great-grandparent is 1.562, blah, 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 or 1 64th of your DNA in common. But if we go out the male line, so this woman, 50% of her X chromosome is from her father, which is the exact same as her grandmother. We go out here, 25, half of this DNA, or 25% of hers, is from her great-grandmother and her second great-grandmother. So you're skipping a generation. You're not having that DNA is being halved each generation. And that can really give you ideas and clues on some of these inner lines of the family tree that aren't direct male, direct female, or you would have lost 50% of each generation. Are we good with that? Yeah? Okay. So Y chromosome. The Y DNA test, like I said, Y DNA is carried by males. It's passed along the paternal line. And now you can see this is an electron microscope. You can see it is not the same size or configuration as an X chromosome, which is why there's no recombination between the two. So it, you can't exchange information. Now, there's two different tests, testing information you're going to get back when you take a Y chromosome test, and they're called SNPs and STRs. And SNPs give you ethnicity results, like deep ancestral, talking thousands of years ago, um, DNA um, ethnicity results. And STRs, or short tandem repeats, are what you're looking for for a match between two men. So if you take a Y DNA test, there's a couple reasons you may want to. One, it's really good for surname studies. I highly encourage anybody who takes a Y DNA test to enter their data into a surname study. These are found through the Guild of One Name Studies as well as on Family Tree DNA. 
And these are people who share the same surname or variation of spellings on the same surname. And the studies are to try to figure out how all the different branches of a specific surname are related to each other. Um, the people who run the surveys in these studies usually have been doing them for decades, if not, you know, very, very long time genealogical wise, but usually 10 plus years in the DNA field. And they really know who is, when you send your DNA in, they can look at it and say, oh, you belong to this group of people. And they group people by um, common ancestors, shared matches, and then really try to help them pinpoint who their furthest back male ancestor could be. Um, and it's a really good way to meet other people you may never have known you're related to, and especially to fill in some genealogical holes that you might have in that side of your family tree. It's also really good for adoptions, especially if you're a male adoptee, because right then with one test, you now know your paternal lineage genetically. You still have a lot of, de of genealogical work to do, but it can give you a lot of information in one test. Now, there are some lineage societies out there who are now accepting Y DNA information as well as autosomal DNA information for membership applications. So that could be another route, especially if you have paper loss and you're trying to fill it. You can't do it all with a paper trail. Okay. So it also tells you, like I said, deep ancestry, and those are called haplogroups. Has anybody ever heard of a haplogroup or a haplotree? All right, some people have. I have a couple of people shaking their head no. You can think of first a haplotree as a tree. The oldest known ethnicity being the trunk, and every time there was a change in the DNA, a branch would form. And if you follow trunk to limb to branch to twig way out to the leaf, the leaf is you and your haplogroup. Okay? And if you can trace that information all the way back and see how your lineage migrated around the world. So it gives you real far back information. So here's an example of Y DNA, Y chromosome inheritance patterns. Now every blue block on here are related to the common ancestor up here. Okay? So this gentleman had three sons and one daughter. Well, the daughter isn't highlighted because she has no Y DNA. She will not pass that DNA on. Okay? And you can go down and down and down. Now, in some instances, you might come down like this grandson. He had two daughters. Well, that DNA line has stopped now. And they call it daughtering out. So, for example, my father's line, the Combs family, for my generation, has daughtered out. I am an only child. I cannot pass on that DNA. You're thinking, okay, well, what about his brother? Well, my uncle had two sons. They had all girls. <laughs> so that line has now daughtered out. To find a living male Combs that would carry my ancestral Combs line, I have to go back to my father's great-grandfather and down to find a living Combs because everybody else either had no children, their boys died without issue, or they had all girls. So... Sometimes that's why lines die out. And it's the same thing with um, mitochondrial DNA. For me, my mother's mitochondrial DNA has stopped with me. I have two boys. My children can't pass that information on. To find a living person with my direct maternal line, I have to go back to my second great-grandmother and forward. And there are two women alive who have the same mitochondrial DNA from the same ancestor as me because they either had no children, children died young, or they had all boys. So it happens in every family line, which is why you may not be able to take a test for a line that you are interested in and will then have to go to your pedigree chart to figure out who is alive today that I can bribe, excuse me, I can, <laughs> I can give them 
chocolate chip cookies and volunteer to pay for the test <laughs> to see if they would be willing to take a DNA test for me. Okay, so what's tested? Like I said, it's FTRs and SNPs. So FTR stands for single nucleotide repeat, and it's the genetic marker that shows basically the identical by descent for autosomal. Okay, this is how you are related and where you match. And then SNP is the poly single nucleotide polymorphism that tells you about your haplogroup or your deep ancestral ethnicity and ancestry. So if you take a Y DNA test, this is what it'll look like. We're really, scientists sometimes are very straightforward and literal. So you'll see it says DYS. DYS stands for DNA Y segment. DYS, DNA Y segment. And this is the marker number. So all of the genes, all of the markers on the Y chromosome that we use for genetics, for genealogy, are given a number. So for example, this is DYS number 393, so DNA Y segment number 393, and then it gives you a value. So this is a 13. Now these are repeats. So what it's looking at is the DNA at that marker repeats 13 times. And you want somebody who has the same marker and the same repeat. Then you know you are a match there. Okay? The goal is if you have all matches at 37 markers, this is a 37 marker test, if you have all matches, you have a common ancestor within the past five generations. Okay? If you start having mismatches where the numbers do not add up, it push, starts pushing that common ancestor back in time. Okay? The more markers you test, the more confident you can be in how closely you are related. So you can start at 37 markers, and then you go up to 63, and then there's 111, and then there's the big Y, which is the entire Y chromosome. So you can test it all, or you can start little and build up. And this test is only available at Family Tree DNA, which then this is the nice part. When you submit your DNA, they will store it for 25 years. So if you decide, oh, I want to up it to the next level, they'll just pull your sample out. And as long as there's still a viable sample in there, they won't have to ask you for another cheek swab. They'll just go ahead and run it again until they run out of DNA. If you keep asking for tests, eventually you'll have to submit a new sample. Does this make sense? I don't know what happened. It was not me. Okay. Yep. It's like I touched the screen. No. <laughs> okay. So let's move on to mitochondria. Now, everything we've discussed so far happens in the nucleus of the cell, and that's an image of the cell up there. Um, and the nucleus is the big purple round thing, and the DNA are floating in there. Mitochondria, however, are not inside the nucleus. Mitochondrial DNA are in these little things called mitochondria. If you ever took high school biology, you may remember them, that they are the powerhouse of the cell. They actually create energy. So all I talk with my hands. Every time I do this, my mitochondria are sending out energy for me to use and burn. Okay? And inside the mitochondria, and there are hundreds of them in every cell, are little round pieces of DNA. And there are thousands of little round pieces of DNA inside each mitochondria and inside each cell. So you have literally millions and millions of these in your body. Now, um, like I said, it's passed from a mother to all of her children. Um, and if you're interested in the evolutionary biology about why this happened, I am more than happy to tell you the theories on why we have these strange little apparatuses inside. It's very fascinating. <laughs> But that's for a different conversation. <laughs> so what is tested? Now, there are 16,569 base pairs in a standard mitochondria. It can vary. Um, it can be a little bit less. It can be a little bit more. But it's about 16,500 is what everybody has in one of those little rings. 
Now the results come back in a table form and once again, just like with Y-DNA, we are looking for people to match us exactly on that table. If they match us exactly, we are related once again at about 95% and about the last five generations. Unfortunately, the, the more errors you have or the less in common you are with somebody, it pushes you further back in time. Um, for a while, there were three tests you could take. Now everybody just takes the full mitochondrial DNA, but when uh, mitochondrial DNA testing started, you could test the hypervariable region one or two or something called the coding region. The problem is with the hypervariable region one and two, if you had a match, it was a 50% possibility, okay, so only a 50% possibility that you and somebody else were related within 23 generations. <laughs> I can't get back 23 generations on my direct maternal line. If you can, I am impressed. And my line stops because I have Mary Unknown in the early 1700s in Goochland, Virginia, which is very unhelpful. <laughs> Um, and that's a lot of the stumbling blocks for people, is women in Western society lose that maiden name a lot of the times. And there's sometimes no record of who they were before they were married. So now it is much easier to find matches because they test the entire 16,000 base pairs. And we have gone from a 50% at 23 generations down to a 95% within five. There's still an odd possibility it might be further back in time, but it all depends on how you inherited the DNA. So this is what the results screen looks like. And all it does, because they're not gonna give you a spreadsheet showing all 16,000 answers, okay? So these are how you differ from the standard. And there is a homo sapien standard, there's a mouse standard, there's a rat standard. Every being out there has a mitochondrial standard. We used to be compared to, I think it was the mouse standard until we, we got one of our own <laughs> a few years ago. So now it's much better. But essentially these are the differences. Because as with all DNA, anytime it gets replicated, errors can happen. And in genealogy, we like mutation and errors because that allows us to define different lines of a family tree, okay? That's how we get a new branch on those haplo, haplo groups and haplo trees. So for this one, in the hypervariable region one, these are my results. And I should have the letter T. There's four base pairs, A, C, T, and G. And I should have a T at marker number 16,126, but instead my DNA has changed to a letter C at some point in time. So that's how you read these results. And you want the people you match with to have the same changes as you, okay? And sometimes along the way, your DNA decides to get fancy. And if you look here at hypervariable region two, I have some, like for this one, at marker number 522, I have two insertions. So when it was duplicating my DNA, it decided I needed extra DNA, and it inserted at, after marker 522, an A, and then after the A, it inserted a C. So I have two mutations at that marker, okay? If you have a deletion, it would have had a negative sign in front of it, showing you that you had a piece of DNA removed from that marker. All completely normal, all fine, doesn't affect us in most instances. Um, for normal, healthy people who do not have a mitochondrial genetic disease, this is totally normal. DNA is supposed to change. That's what keeps us alive and healthy as a species. Are we good so far? Okay, so the big question I get every time I do this is why do my ethnicity results change based on what company I test at? 
So I want to make sure to address that because for some people they're trying, they do a test because they want to prove that they have XYZ ethnicity or is the family legend true or they're just curious. And then when they test at multiple places, they're like, so which is true? Why, why does it change what is going on here? So it's for a couple reasons. So first of all, these three terms, ethnicity, admixture, and biogeographical estimate, if you see these in an article or uh, on the line somewhere or in a, a pamphlet, they all mean the same thing. They are just three different words for the exact same thing, which is how somebody assigns a what's called reference population to your DNA. Okay? So... A reference population is the group of people that a company has assigned to represent that ethnicity. Most companies will find somebody who's either in their database or they go to locations and find people who fit their criteria to do a DNA test. That usually means that you your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents, so four generations, have lived within 20 miles of each other your entire lives. You've never left the place you're from. And that's what the companies decide to do for their reference population. Okay, so those are the people they're going to compare you to to see if you have similar ethnic markers. Just like with autosomal DNA, you can lose ethnic markers over time. It depends on what you've inherited from your parents. So siblings may not match, first cousins may not match, and you may lose, especially if the ethnicity you're trying to prove is further back in time, you may not have inherited any of that at all, right? Because 50% of your ancestral DNA is lost every generation, okay? So, I think I answered all that in one question already. <laughs> so here's an example that I like to show. This is my father, and that's his sister and brother. So a lot of people, just by looking at ethnicity, would say, oh, there's no way they're related, right? This person is, like, all over the map. They have stuff from the British Isles all the way down here to Turkey, a little bit of the Mediterranean. Lots of things going on. They must be, you know, a very diverse background. And then you have the, I am from the frigid north through central Europe. Okay? But these, full siblings, I have the DNA. They all match genetically. They all come out as full siblings. But for some reason, my father got a lot more in the mix than his two siblings did. Because my Uncle Bob and my Aunt Jane or that. <laughs> and all I can say is they got a lot more of the German ancestry than my father did, and he obviously got a lot more of the um, French, British Isles, and all of the Irish. That's all I can think of, okay? But it's very different. But it doesn't mean you're not related to somebody. It just, you inherited the bits differently, and they do have different matches. There are some people that show up in my uncle and my aunt's match list that are not in my father's match list. And that's totally normal. It's just how they inherited the DNA. So these are four of the companies for ethnicity. And these are all my results. So you can see how different they are. So my origins, this is my heritage. Now my heritage is really good and they specialize in European, especially um, Jewish ancestry, Eastern European, uh, Mediterranean, that's kind of their focus. It's a company based out of Tel Aviv, but they have a wonderful American database and a lot of American um, uh, DNA testing. But according to them, I am 98% European. I am very European according to my genealogy, that checks out. Um, specifically, 85% England, Wales, and Scotland. 10% Iberian Peninsula, 3% Baltic, and then less than 3% Middle Eastern, Anatolia, Armenia, and Mesopotamia. And I'm just going to go back here. That would be where I got this from. That would be my father <laughs> coming straight through there. Now, 
This one is Ancestry. And Ancestry just went through an update, but mine hasn't been updated yet. So this is the last update from them. I'm interested to see how it changes. Um, and I am 36% England and Northwestern Europe, 25% Scotland, 9% Sweden and Denmark, 8% Wales, 7% Norway, 7% Germanic Europe, 7% Ireland, and 1% Basque. Spanish, Iberian Peninsula, and Basque, kind of the same thing. All right, this one is, um, oh God, I've lost track. No, this was Family Tree DNA. This one's my heritage. Oh, I should have labeled these. Sorry. 50% Scandinavian, 21.8% Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, 19.7% Iberian, and 7.6% West Asian. Okay. <laughs> and this one is Living DNA, which is a British company that is making inroads here in the United States. Their claim to fame, especially if you have British roots, is that they can locate the county you're from. Wow. <laughs> and they're pretty close. So, and they are slowly moving into continental Europe. So they're, they are adding more territory. So according to them, I am 99.9% .9 Northwestern European, 80.4% 80 British and Irish, specifically from the top two are Glasgow City, Scotland, which is funny because that's where I'm getting my degree from, <laughs> and County Dublin, Ireland. And then I am 19.5% French and German, specifically Lower Saxony, Germany. Well, yes, ma'am. What was the name of that company? This one is called Living DNA. Okay. They also, if you're curious about it, will tell you how much Viking you are. <laughs> yes. So, Shannon, you didn't put in 23 in me. Is that something you don't, you don't have a lot of love for them? Or? I didn't because these were the most interesting. And for some reason, 23 and me, it's almost in the... For me, it's almost an exact copy of Ancestry. So I wanted you all to be able to see a nice variety. Um, but they do have a, a few differences as well, because you're going to see it based on what their reference population is. You're going to see a little bit of differences. But th for me, they're almost an exact copy of Ancestry. So, but there's a couple takeaways I want you to see here. Um, especially for that Spanish portion of my DNA, which when these test results started coming back, my dad looked at me and went, excuse me? Because <laughs> he's like, I am Irish and German. It, pardon? What is going on here? But I mean, I have that 10% Iberian Peninsula, 1% Basque, and 19% Iberian. Okay? What is going on here? Well, one, I kind of think this is the My Heritage one, who specialize in Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, Eastern European. I kind of like these results for that purpose because those are the, the reference populations they have the, the most information on. Ancestry and the other companies are heavy on the British Isles, Germanic, French, because let's face it, a lot of Americans have, majority of Americans have that population in their background somewhere. So there's a lot of data there. Um, the other thing to point out, and some people, especially where they're like, why do you keep getting the Nordic countries? And this is where I like to say social history and knowing history of the areas your family could be from is crucial to understanding, especially ethnicity results. A lot of the British Isle, Scottish, and Irish areas that my family came from were heavily settled by the Norse. There are people who still live there today that are heavy Norse ancestry because they've never left the area and the Norse occupation lasted for several hundred years. So those Viking DNA genes are strong in those family lines, which means you still have Sweden and Denmark and Norway and, you know, the cold north coming through. And if you have northern Germany roots, it's going to be the same thing. Doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean you're from Sweden, Denmark, Norway, but you definitely have a genetic link somewhere. 
Now, I, the only way I figured out where the heck this Iberian, Spanish, West Asian came from is when I took a trip in 2018, we, um, my, my mother-in-law and my husband and my two children, we all went to Ireland for Christmas. And Ireland at Christmas is very boring. It shuts down. But we had a wonderful time in the country. <laughs> um, we went to Galway. We were staying out in Clare. They have a wonderful city museum if you ever go there. It's right next to the Spanish Arch, right outside of the Latin Quarter. <laughs> Iberian Peninsula. Iberian Peninsula. Basque. Um, and what I found out when I was talking to, uh, we were waiting for my mother-in-law and my children to finish the museum, um, I was talking with one of the docents there who is also heavy into family history, and I was telling her um, that my second great-grandparents immigrated uh, from the Galway area in the 1850s, and she was like, oh, and I was like, yeah, and then we start, she's like, oh, that's fascinating, blah, 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 last name Brennan, oh, good luck. Um, and then I was like, yeah, we started talking about DNA, because that's what I do. And I said, I have this really weird result. And she goes, it's not weird. A lot of our population has Spanish ancestry. We had over 500 years of trade with Spain and the Mediterranean, because we are a calm water port on that side of Ireland. That's why we have a Latin Quarter. That's <laughs> why we have great tapas. We have a, Latin, a Spanish arch here. I was like, oh. So... That was that is from my grandmother, my father's mother's side. Um, those were her direct ancestors who came over from Galway, and that obviously has passed down to me. Now here's the sad part: one of my children has inherited that, but the other one has been lost to. So his descendants will have none of this Iberian genetics showing up, but my other son, if he has children, it will maybe, for another generation, because it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. So, just remember, DNA is a tool, not an alternative to genealogical research. It can aid you. It can help you. It can leave you going, what the heck am I looking at? But it's a tool. Okay, so make sure you use a screwdriver for the screws and a hammer for the nails, and you'll be good. Um, make sure to use tests in conjunction as much as possible with paper research, and then ask lots of questions. There are excellent books out there in libraries and online, um, webinars all the time. Um, there's actually, if this is something that you're very, very interested in, the first weekend of October, there is a gene genetic genealogy conference happening in Baltimore. So if you're interested in spending three days talking nothing but genetic genealogy, look at the East Coast Genetic Genealogy Conference. Um, and if you haven't been out to look at your results in a while, if you've taken a test, I always recommend going back at least two to three times a year if you're not actively searching those databases because updates are made. New people test all the time, and the thing is you never know where somebody is going to test. They could test everywhere like me because they're weird, or they could choose to test just at one company and then eventually in a few years test at another company. So you never know who's going to show up in your matches list. And on that note, we can open it up to any questions online or here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so one question from online says, my father is the last male in his line. Which DNA test would you recommend he take? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> so being the last male in a line, I obviously would recommend taking a Y DNA test, right? So that way you can get that direct paternal if he has no other siblings or he had no sisters who could have passed on that mitochondrial DNA, definitely the mitochondrial DNA before it's lost. And then um, since he would be the oldest person of that generation, it gets you back one more generation at level, so autosomal. Um, the testing strategy I would use is... Um, Ancestry DNA is the only testing company that does not allow you to upload raw results to it. So get him an ancestry DNA test 
because then if you want to take that data to other companies, you can download those raw data and for a lower price, get into other companies. But for mitochondrial and Y, you have to test at family tree DNA. So those are your options. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. As a genetic genealogy tool, what is your opinion of GED Match and DNA Painter? Okay, so love DNA Painter. DNA Painter, for those of you who don't know what it is, it is a free tool where you can take um, segment information for your matches and then it will paint, paint them on a chromosome browser for you. What's nice about it is you can take, except for Ancestry, you can take information from MyHeritage, 23andMe, and Family Tree DNA, maybe Living DNA. I think that's in the works still. Um, and then you, it's kind of like you can compare three companies to one, so it's really nice. Um, and I think it's totally worth the, the, I think it's what, $10 a month membership fee if you want to, to expand on your one free program. Excellent tool, does a lot of really great things. Purely just for going out there, they have um, the chromosome project, the Centimorgan project, where you can take, some of the companies give you a how much percent you're related to some people, and some people give you a number followed by a CM, that stands for Centimorgan. Um, at the Centimorgan project on DNA Painter, you can put those numbers in and it will show you on a picture who your common ancestors could be. So it gives you a place to start if you have no idea where to start looking on the tree. Jed Match, um, I used to love it. <laughs> it's still a really good tool, but I always caution people because they, they, after they were sold from the original um, creators, the new company does have it opened up so that it is a, a database for law enforcement to use your DNA to find people for cold cases. So if that is something that gives you pause, even though it is a free tool, you can pay for a monthly membership to have access to higher levels. If that gives you a pause, and it does for some people, they don't want to be in any sort of database like that, um, it's definitely something that's not for you. However, if you do choose to use the company, they do have some really good tools, especially if you have um, a what's called endogamy or pedigree, large amounts of pedigree collapse. So where you have, where you are related, you and your matches could potentially be related to a lot of people, like have multiple common ancestors. It can help tell you exactly how your parents are related to each other in those cases. And that's important for people who are from small, ethnic, religious, uh, minority communities that don't necessarily leave the community too often to find spouses. So like um, Ashkenazi or Sephardic Jewish, Mennonite, um, Amish, some of the Pacific Islander um, nations, anywhere that you could be cut off from finding an outside spouse. Iceland, for instance. Iceland has their own, gen they actually have a genetic database so that before you get married, they make sure you're not too closely related. Yeah, because it is a problem. They are an ice, a geographically isolated island. So, GEDmatch, I'm like, that is a personal gut check. There are good tools there, but you have to be willing to submit your data to that. Yes? A couple more online that are sure. asking specifically about the cost. One asks, what is the cost of the living DNA test testing compared with other testers? And another one says, DNA testing is so expensive. Is there any suggestions on what to do? Okay, so autosomal DNA tests are all now under $100. And l coming up will be Black Friday sales. <laughs> <laughs> um, October is also um, Family History Month, so a lot of companies will also have sales for family history. And then there's always sales around Mother's Day, Father's Day, Flag Day. I mean, think of a holiday and there may be a DNA sale, okay? You, I have seen tests for as low as $50 on these sales, okay? Um, autosomal will be the cheapest test. 
and they are all now about the same price. They're all within about $10, give or take tax and shipping. Um, if you want to just do autosomal DNA, my testing strategy, once again, is tested Ancestry first because Ancestry has the largest 37 million tests. It is the largest database in the world with over 30, com 30 countries represented. Um, you will find people from everywhere. My husband is getting matches from Tasmania right now. So you will find people from everywhere around the world. Um, the reason I say test there is because unlike the other four major companies in the United States, you can't test somewhere else and then upload your raw data to Ancestry. You have to physically test there. But once you've tested there for, I think, I think a regular price kit is like 79 something dollars not on sale, um, you can download your data for free and then take it to any other company. Most of them have a, it's about $30 just to be able to upload your DNA. Like if you if it's a like my heritage, if you don't want access to their genealogy database, you just want to upload your DNA. It's much cheaper than purchasing a my heritage subscription. Uh, Family Tree DNA will do it as well. Um, so there's obviously you'll have to pay more if you want to do more with the company, but just for uploading, it's like thirty dollars. However. If you want to test your Y or your mitochondrial, once again, you, are only, you can only test right now at Family Tree DNA. They are the only company that does matching. So if you just want to know like your deep ancestry and your haplogroup and where your family migrated around the world thousands of years ago, you can do that at MyHeritage, you can do that at 23andMe, and you can do that at Living DNA. If you actually want to be able to match with another person, you have to test a family tree DNA. And those tests run anywhere from $150 to close to $700, depending on how much you want to test. But like I said before, the good thing is they will hold your sample on file, so you can always start low, budget-friendly low, <laughs> and then just add on increments as you want to, if you want to. Some people start low and never add anything else on. So, one more? I have two more. Oh, I'm okay. Gonna, I'm going to get to you both because I think they're related. One okay. is, can you talk a little bit about the privacy part of it? And another person specifically asked, is GED Match the only company that is sharing with law enforcement? Okay, they're not. So I'll start with that one first. Um, Family Tree DNA, you can opt into Share, like you have to click a button. Um, after Bennett Greenspan sold the company several years ago, the new um, owners, they have an agreement with some law enforcement companies. As long as they follow the rules, they won't get kicked out. And you have to opt in to sharing your information. There's a little checkbox. Um, but they're the only ones. Um, Ancestry has successfully fought and one cases where law enforcement have tried to get into their database and Ancestry being a multi-billion dollar company, I don't think anyone's going to win anytime soon um, because they can keep fighting it in court for privacy reasons. And none of the other ones um, have, they're, they're kind of following the, well, Ancestry, you know, that's the case, the case law, so we don't have to share with you. Um, so there's that part. And the other one was, I've already lost it. It's just in general. The, the, the privacy. privacy. So the, the thing is with, with privacy, um, nobody is going to want the information we, honestly, nobody is going to want the information we have for genealogy purposes. We don't test the same parts of the DNA as you would for a crime scene, like through CODIS. Um, that and there you lose what's called chain of custody. So just because it has my name on the DNA, it doesn't mean it's actually my DNA. So unlike crime scene data and information where it has to go through and it's always in a, a chain of custody and it, everybody knows where it is and that type of thing, um, there's none of that with G 
commercial genealogy programs. So what there, so if that's the, what you're worried about, I say don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, because honestly, if law enforcement wanted your DNA, they'll just follow you around till you blow your nose and put the Kleenex in the trash can, and then it's public so they can take it, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> um, and God knows, my mother was in the military, and my husband does government work, so my DNA is out there, I'm sure. It was probably stolen by the Chinese years ago. But um, it's, it's not that big of a thing, uh, because what... What people are doing now when they're assisting law enforcement agencies and they're going out here and finding these matches, they're going to the companies that allow it, so GEDmatch, Family Tree DNA, looking at the databases, and then they're doing what we're going to do, right? Oh, there's a match. Let's work the Family Tree. So they're working from public available records, doing just what we would be doing, right? And then they'll take that information and say, Here's what we have put together as a clue, and now it's up to the agency, the law enforcement agency, to decide we can get a warrant on that, or we're going to take this and do our own research, but they have to then go through the legal process after a forensic genealogist provides them the genealogy clue. And that's really all it is, is a, this is a potential source, this is a potential idea, this is the type of person we're looking for, or they have this type of heritage, that's what is being provided by genealogists. So they're not, and then they have to ask you permission because you have to, as the match, have to come in and give another DNA test because then it is in the chain of custody. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I have a complex question. Oh! <laughs> um, in reference to my husband and brother. Okay. They both tested, they've always been told they're German. Okay. We now have written evidence that they came from Germany. They tested 23 and me and Ancestry, they compare. Mm -hmm. No German. Okay. And the DNA. So where do we go from here to try and figure out the mystery? Well, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> So for those of you at home who may not have been able to hear the question, her husband and her brother, no, his brother, his brother always were told that they have German ancestry, took a DNA test, and no German ancestry. Um, so this happened to my husband. He has a, sec a second great-grandmother from Denmark, which came over from Copenhagen, and then he has a second great-grandmother who came over from um, oh Baden-Württemberg. I had to think of it for a second. Um, he has no Germanic in him at all. It's like Sweden, um, not, yeah, Nor Norway, Iceland, and the British Isles. But none of that from down there. So it's a, did they inherit it as it got passed down? Because I don't know how far back in time it is. So it's... 1800s? 1800s. Yeah, so that was my husband's second great-grandmother's. They came over in the 1870s. Um, so that's only three generations back for him. His sister has the, the German markers. He didn't inherit them. Their sister does not. Right. So what I'm saying is if it's further back in time, the farther it is back in time, either the smaller the ethnic segment that you could inherit or you may not, he may not have inherited it at all because it's just like autosomal DNA. It breaks down and divides every generation. So the further back in time, the smaller the percent until it's gone. And either it didn't get passed down or it got passed down to another part of the family. Uh, well, that's it, the three of them. Yeah. Direct line. Yeah. Should they test another place? You or could. Or do we just have to go to paper records? Well, if you're trying to prove that specific ethnicity, you could always try another company because obviously, I mean, let's go back a couple slides here. There's a, there's a lot of variety depending on what they call, that company calls Germany because Germany really didn't exist until the 20th century. They were actually Prussia. Right. So Prussia, you, do you have any Russian showing up or Baltic? 
Or because that's what my Baltic no, it's is. like 99% Irish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you test? Uh, 23 in the DNA, uh, Ancestry. Okay. Um, it, I, I, I would trust Ancestry more than 23 Meeks because of the different breakdowns. Um, all I can think of is that it is it was a variety of ethnicities and they've just been lost over time. Yeah. Question. Yeah. And we can't just any of those. No, you can't, but you could always, you, you could look at, so some of the companies, you can now, when you find a match, some of the companies are now showing you when you click on them, the ethnicities that they have as well. So you could always try to find somebody who would have been a common ancestor, so we're second, third, fourth cousins, and see if any of them, what their ancestors, as long as you remember that they do have some other ones, obviously, right. filtering through from other lines. But you could see, did any of them pick up that, do they have a significant Germanic um, or Central slash Eastern European showing up? Um, so my father-in-law, the results that we get for his German ancestor, we get um, Baltic, Russia, and lower central Europe. So, kind of have to think about migration patterns and social history and... Social history is one of them. Yeah, how people moved. You didn't want to be Irish at that time. <laughs> yeah. Changed their name. <laughs> Could be. People change names and all the time. And it was never at Ellis Island, right. just right. so y'all know. <laughs> that is a total myth. Whatever was on the manifest is what you came over with. <laughs> if you lied to the manifest, that's on you. So. All right. Anyone? Oh, oh let's get him first. And then, yes, sir. Are you planning on doing any presentations on the paper side of the research? I, I do, and I have. Um, you want to hear some case studies? Is that what you're looking for? No, I'm just looking for a roadmap. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, and if you look at the um, resources section, some of those books that I've listed in the back have step-by-step -step directions in them. Um, and if, you, if they don't have them here, you're, most of the public libraries here in Northern Virginia carry those books. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I was just curious, um, when they tested for DNA for like Egyptian Romans and stuff, uh -huh. what did they, which... How they do that? I mean, what are they looking for? Right. So for um, there is and what they call historic or um, ancestral DNA testing done um, nowadays. Whenever they open, uh, they find um, human remains. It's kind of like what they did with Richard the Third um, mummies. Now, also, I mean, some of the museums when they're opening up the sarcophaguses and and the glasses, the glass cases, they've been under for you know decades, if not a century or more. If they can, they are taking DNA from teeth. Um, if it's still there, sometimes they can find like long bone marrow and take DNA. And what they're doing is anthropologists and um, geneticists who specialize in ancient history are analyzing those results. And then for the ethnicity part, they are actually adding them to the haplotrees especially for Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA, so we can start to see lines that have literally died out. Because the lines that we have out there right now are the ones that are living today. And there are literally thousands, if not more, maybe even millions of lines that have died out through the eons, right? Because they just never got passed on. Um, but it also can add to our understanding of human migration, um, patterns of disease, uh, other historical events that have happened, how it has affected, um, <coughs> pardon me, especially after things like the plague and the Black Death, where we had what was called a bottlenecking. So the human population became so small, it's called a bottleneck because then all of a sudden you just have this small population growth. So that's how it's said that 90% of people who are of Western European descent are all descended from Charlemagne. Well, there were so many descendants, and then so many of them survived that bottleneck. 
So all these people out here, lines died out. So it's only the ones that survived that got passed on. So looking at those ancient DNA segments and samples can really start to add to our understanding of how we've evolved as a species, um, as a people moving around the planet, how things have changed, what has fallen off, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more question okay. of mine, asking about a British DNA, is Living DNA the British DNA company? I mean, no. Yes, um, Living DNA is based out of the United Kingdom, but they are making inroads here in the United States. Yep. Yes, ma'am. I really like your idea about um, formulating a hypothesis. Uh -huh. What I want to know is, are there any of the resources that will help with that? Because I, I have a hypothesis, mm -hmm. and I went through, and I thought I proved it. A yeah. new cousin started at the beginning and went through and came to the same conclusion I did without knowing what my conclusion was. Right. And I worked with a search angel who did the same thing. We all regained the exact same conclusion, but then a subsequent DNA test proved that none of it was right. So, <laughs> I am similar. Um, the brick road, I think, is in my brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, the brick wall, is, right. it's in my brain. I, I can't think of another way to go, and I'm not sure what to do about it. I'm wondering, if are any of the resources that you have especially good for helping people start all over again from scratch? Right. So starting over from scratch, creating a research process, a new hypothesis, those right. types of things. So in my hand, can I borrow your handout real quick? Wait, in the handout, the two resources that I have that would probably work the best for you. Um, so the one by by Brian Kirkpatrick and myself, while it says DNA Guide for Adoptees, it is really good for any brick wall. Okay? Um, because we give multiple, we talk about lots and lots of different things, but it's multiple ways to break something down. The other one is um, Debbie Parker Wayne and Blaine Bettinger, Genetic Genealogy in Practice. That's by the National Genealogical Society. And it is a workbook. So they go through how to do methodologically, step by step, break down a problem. And it's a workbook. You go through it. You work the problems. They give you the answers. They and they teach you how to think that way. So um, the article um, from the Board of Certification of Genealogists by Judy Russell, it's about a page and a half, two page article, but she has some really good resource, online resources for how to create research processes, how to create hypotheses based on information. But that one's online, it's not a physical book, so yeah. Yeah. Just say Judy Russell will be speaking here next March. There you go. So if we pick up our, our Judy Russell will be here in March. She is excellent and now lives in Virginia, so <laughs> she's closer than New Jersey. <laughs> okay. One more question. Oh, sure. Is a fraternity test the same as a Y DNA test? Is a paternity test the same as a Y DNA test? No. No. Y DNA specifically tests the Y chromosome. Paternity is actually a very specific autosomal test. And one other one, I'm not sure I understand the question. It looks like NASCAR mommy's DNA studies, are they available to the public? I have no idea what that is. Thank you. Sorry. I, <laughs> I don't know what that one is. Okay. Yes. I have one question. Do you have a couple of Ginia, what? Ginia. Ginia, no. You have to talk to me later about that. I'll have to do the research on it. I saw somebody else. Yes, sir. So the Y chromosome is passed directly from father to son. Correct. It doesn't recombine with any other. So technically, if you have a direct family line going back 500 years, the Y chromosome would be identical to you. So, theoretically. 
because the Y chromosome, just like all other DNA, sometimes DNA likes to get feisty and likes to um, replicate itself with differences in it. So Y DNA can be a slower mutation rate. Um, sometimes it doesn't change for many, 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 many generations, hundreds of years, and then one son will get a mutation and all of a sudden you have a new line. Um, but 500 years ago, if you have a match at 37 markers, that would be, you know, if it's not a perfect match to you, it could be like you could have three, two, three, sometimes even four differences and still be related in what they call the genealogical time frame, which is when um, sur Western surnames were created, so about 500 years ago. There's some amazing studies um, because the UK are big into Y DNA studies. Um, because they also have excellent parish records that go back that far. Um, there's a really good study that is looking at the ancestors of the Bannock Burn battle, and they have traced those with Y DNA, as well as some other studies um, further down in central England that you can find online. They talk all about how they did it and how the mutation rates and everything. But yeah, it could change or it could be identical. Just the, the, the longer the line is, the more chances there are for there to be little changes here or there. And that just makes, means that you, it's easier for you to identify which sun you're through. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I hope you learned something new. <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.